Alrighty, let's uh, let's get going. So uh, we've been talking about various forms of concurrency control, and uh, as a couple of people pointed out so far, um, most of those concurrency control techniques are uh, somewhat limited. And in particular, uh, the the main technique we've discussed so far is this idea of locking. Uh, we've defined two concrete notions of uh, what it means for, con for uh, concurrency control to be correct, uh, specifically uh, conflict and view equivalence. Um, and as several people have noted, uh, both locking is uh, typically not sufficient to purely encode uh, the, the, the full flexibility that uh, view and um, that, that uh, conflict serializability uh, will get you. And so today, uh, to basically wrap up the concurrency control uh, segment, to finally finish with chapter 17, um, we're going to talk about a couple of uh, more advanced techniques that will actually give you quite a bit more flexibility uh, at the cost of potentially doing uh, wasted computations. So uh, to be a little more concrete, uh, the concurrency control techniques we've discussed so far are uh, what's known as pessimistic. Uh, the glass is half empty kind of things. Um, the idea is essentially that you assume that anything that can go wrong uh, will go wrong and you modify your system to essentially exclude any possibility of anything going wrong ever. Um, this includes things like locking where you essentially prevent any sort of uh, schedule from being executed uh, that could potentially lead to something that isn't serializable. Um, this includes things like dependency graphs, where you uh, track every single transaction and everything that it's doing and uh, make sure that if it ever gets into some uh, situation where it could potentially be doing something out of order, then it gets killed. Uh, so this, this is extremely expensive, and... Um, this is extremely expensive. If you're using locking, uh, locking is anyone, well, if you've taken uh, operating systems or distributed systems, uh, locking is generally uh, frowned upon because it's, it, I mean, it, it prevents you from doing a lot of stuff. Um, it's extremely restrictive uh, in that it uh, doesn't allow you to do every single schedule that could potentially be correct. And so what we want to do is we want a way of uh, sort of rather than assuming that things will go wrong from the start, uh, we, can, we can be optimistic. We can uh, assume that nothing will go wrong. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, be optimistic, but don't necessarily, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that nothing will actually go wrong. Uh, assume that uh, when you run your transaction, you, you run it as if nothing will go wrong. But then after the transaction completes, you verify to see whether uh, that assumption is correct. And the, the core principle of this, this technique is that you run it as um, run each transaction uh, and don't actually make the results public, as you, uh, the, the effects of that transaction public, until after the transaction completes. Uh, once the transaction completes and commits, then make everything visible and uh, ensure that uh, no, no uh, transaction violation, uh, concurrency violations happened. Uh, was there a question? Uh, so to be a little more concrete, in an optimistic concurrency control setting, uh, a transaction gets evaluated in three phases. Uh, first, you perform uh, all of the reads that the transaction needs to do. And while you're, you're uh, sorry, uh, the first phase is known as the read phase because the transaction, um, its reads go to the database, but any writes that get performed by the transaction actually get buffered. They, they sit around and are visible only to that one transaction uh, that, that generated them. Um, after the read phase occurs, we look at all of the, the, the outputs of that particular transaction, all of the, the writes that that transaction has performed, and make sure that they don't conflict with, uh, that, that there is some, some sort of uh, conflict serializability that we can uh, make sure that, that that sequence of operations, if we write every, well, okay, let me, 
first skip to that last step. Uh, the write phase is basically when you take all of the, uh, the, the outputs of that particular transaction and actually commit them to the database, write them to the database. And that's essentially, that essentially means that all of the reads happen at the start, all of the writes happen at the end. And you want to make sure that there's no, um, no transaction that has performed a set of reads that could potentially uh, interact poorly with those writes that you, you uh, did. And that happens during this validation phase. Uh, let me be a little more concrete about that. Um, what we want to do is we want to test to see whether any sort of conflicts have actually occurred. So what we can do is use a form of, uh, of time stamping uh, where we essentially tag every, every transaction with, with a timestamp and make sure that the, the uh, reads performed that, by that transaction always occur on um, a consistent set of timestamps and they always occur on uh, they always occur uh, when we perform a write um, the, basically the, the writes should uh, potentially Uh, what should we call it? Uh, we want to make sure that the writes that uh, get performed by the transaction end up actually getting uh, written to uh, essentially we want the, re uh, the, the reads performed by the transaction to always be uh, reading on a earlier uh, set of, uh, on a consistent set of timestamps. Uh, I'll make that a little more clear in a moment. Um, right. uh, Ah, sorry, one sec. So let me give you a, an example of this. Let's say we have two transactions that uh, perform in complete isolation. Well, this is perfectly valid. Um, so we do all of the reads, we do the validation, we do all of the writes, and if the write phase of a transaction completes uh, entirely before another transaction starts, this is perfectly safe. Um, nothing has gone wrong. So the simplest possible test that we can perform during the validation phase is whether or not the, uh, the first transaction uh, has, has completed before the second transaction starts, namely, uh, as to say, whether uh, the timestamp that it got assigned is lower than the timestamp that the second transaction... Sorry. Uh, the so as we assign the timestamps, we can keep track of which timestamps uh, we can keep track of which timestamps have completed their write phase. And essentially, if, if trans when transaction TK starts, uh, we track which uh, transactions have uh, completed their write phase. And if for any transaction that has already completed its write phase uh, by the time TK starts, uh, then those transactions are, are essentially guaranteed to be safe. So this is, yes? Uh, the validation phase? Uh, it takes into, it takes both the read set and the write set into consideration. Um, and I will, uh, in the next two slides, you will see how that happens. Okay, uh, so this is, so uh, I guess the first question here is, uh, is this a sufficient set of conditions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this is, this is a, a perfectly sufficient set of conditions because there's no interaction between the transactions whatsoever. On the other hand, is this an efficient test? No, exactly. Uh, obviously any, any transaction that uh, it doesn't allow any sort of interleaving, so that's that's not ideal. Uh, I so this is this is not an ideal test. It is not a complete test. So uh, any questions on this? Um, okay. So a second test that we can perform uh, that is a little more uh, inclusive is we want to be able to test to see whether any writes performed in uh, the earlier transaction. Um, have overwritten something that, uh, that is read by the later transaction. So any sort of writes that happen, well, any, any sort of write, 
the, the, the time, the assumption here is that the timestamp uh, is the serial order that we are trying to emulate. So we want to ensure that anything that gets uh, written to by TI uh, doesn't get read by TK. Uh, so essentially the simplest test uh, for that is to see whether um, the set of objects that get written by TI, namely the right set, uh, intersects with the set of objects that gets read uh, by TK. And if that intersection is empty, then these two transactions have no interactions on, at least on the reads. Uh, so, and write-write transactions are, are, are sorry, write-write uh, are perfectly fine as long as the right phase of TK starts after the right phase of TI uh, completes. Um, any questions on this? Uh, right. So, uh, so the third uh, potential um, tet. So that's potentially that's definitely sufficient. Uh, but once again, there are certain things that it doesn't allow. And so one uh, one other thing we can test for is to now compare uh, which of TI or TK completed its read phase first, um, and that's typically just going to be whether the timestamp of transaction I is lower than the timestamp of transaction uh, TK. And then we just need to test uh, to see whether there are any sort of uh, conflicts that have happened between those two transactions. Uh, so if uh, the read phase of TI has completed first, then clearly the, the, the write phase of TK uh, Every write that TK performs has to happen after every read uh, that TI performs. So all we need to test for is to see whether uh, TI writes something that TK reads, or uh, to whether uh, to test to see whether anything that TI writes, uh, sorry, anything that TK writes could have potentially been overwritten by TI. Now again, this is not entirely complete. But uh, it allows us to ensure that TK, uh, logically speaking, comes after TI. It, it basically enforces uh, the, this, this sort of lack of interaction between TI and TK. Yes? So don't think of these blocks as... Uh, atomic operations. This is a sequence of operations, a sequence of uh, operations where it, uh, transaction TI reads a bunch of data and then buffers a series of writes. Yeah, so I mean, in this group, uh, what you said was, okay, the set of read operations takes place, mm -hmm. then uh, transaction details, uh, set of another read operations that takes place. Those can potentially happen simultaneously. So while TI is reading, uh, TK can also be simultaneously executing read operations. Yes. Depends on what they write, and that's where this uh, read set and write set come in. Um, so uh, I. Just to be clear, uh, the right set of a transaction is the set of all objects that were written to by the, the transaction. Uh, you can, when I say objects, this is basically, the, I'm using the same definition that I've been using throughout the entire uh, concurrency control uh, segment. It's uh, a table, it can be a, a, a row, basically anything that you could potentially block. Uh, it's something that could be in the right set. So the write set is, uh, is the set of objects that it writes. The read set is the set of objects that it reads. Um, and essentially what we're trying to test for here is to see whether uh, there can be any sort of interaction between these two transactions, uh, any sort of negative interaction. When I say ne negative interaction in this case, I mean that... Um, so... Uh, Going back to the, the definition of conflict equivalence, uh, two, transa two, um, two transactions are conflict uh, serializable 
if they are conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. Uh, loosely speaking, uh, all of the conflicting operations, we need to guarantee that all of the conflicting operations between these two transactions occur in the same relative order. Uh, so if transaction TI does a series of reads and transaction TK uh, performs a write on one of those reads, uh, one of those values that it read, uh, we need to make sure that every single conflicting operation in TK, whether it be write read, write write, um, happens after. Uh, that is, uh, basically, we want this to be equivalent to a schedule where TK gets performed entirely after TI. Now, there are three ways to, uh, so far I've presented three different tests uh, to do that. Uh, test one, if the two happen entirely separately, you're good. Uh, the second test, uh, but yes? Well, it's not, you're not testing to see whether there are no conflicts. You're testing to see whether the conflicts always occur in the, are guaranteed to occur in the same order. Uh, test three. Yeah. Uh, test three. Uh, in this particular case, the only potential conflict you could have is write on a t uh, from a value written by TK uh, was read by uh, TI. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, other way around. Uh, TI performs a read on an object and then subsequently uh, TK overwrites it. Yes. So how do you know, in the validation phase, how do you know what's the right step? Maybe the, something else. So the, the idea is that you perform the entire, uh, so the entire transaction gets performed during the read phase. Uh, the, uh, the entire transaction gets performed during the read phase, but rather than exposing the, 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 the actual writes happen locally. They get buffered. Um, so the, all of the writes are, are generated during the read phase. They just don't get applied to the database until the write phase. So essentially, the, the, all of the computation happens here. This, is, this write phase is just pure uh, copy from local, uh, from, one's, uh, from the transaction sort of local representation of the database uh, to the, the public version of the database. Is that clear? OK, uh, right. So we were talking about, um, OK. So you want, essentially, you want TI to, be enti to happen entirely after, uh, to happen entirely uh, before TK. And if the two happen completely independently, great. Um, now there's a second possibility. What if? Uh, so read read is never a problem. Um, so what you're worried about is read write and uh, write write and write read. Now, if transaction TI completes entirely before TK starts its write phase, then the only possible uh, Assuming there are any interactions whatsoever between these two transactions, the only possible situation where this is valid is if TK uh, is, is the transaction that gets moved, uh, moved forward. Uh, the, the only valid serial order for this is TI comes first, uh, T, or TK comes second. Uh, so we can enforce that by essentially checking to see whether TK performs a read on any object that TI uh, wrote out. And if the read phase of TK completes before uh, the write phase of TI, then we're essentially guaranteed, sorry, if the read phase uh, starts after this, after this ends, well, they're completely separate, but we're guaranteed that any read that uh, overlap, any read on an object here happens after a write on an object here. Uh, but if the read phase hasn't completed by that, or hasn't even started by that point, 
there may be an object that TK read that TI subsequently overwrote. Now again, this is not, uh, this is not a complete test, but it's a test that you, you can do with relatively little information. Um, all you need is the time, or the, the point in time, when uh, TI completed, and the uh, and that's basically it. And then the, the read and write sets of the two transactions. So if there's any sort of interaction between these two, uh, between the, the read set and the write set, uh, sorry, the read set of TK and the write set of TI, there is some possibility that some conflict occurred. It's not guaranteed, but there's some possibility that a conflict occurred. And so you want to be a little bit conservative and assume that something has occurred there. Yes. So if they don't operate on any sort of, uh, if there's no conflicts whatsoever, then this intersection will always be empty. Um, but in this case, uh, so basically we want a, a series of, uh, we want several different, uh, so this is, this is slightly more permissive than the last case. So we just want multiple transactions to go through. And if those multiple transactions... Uh, if they don't interact on anything, then we're good. But there are also certain cases where it's possible for them to interact. So if, uh, if two transactions are completely separate, they can interact on whatever they want. Um, if two transactions, uh, so possibility two, and this is slightly more permissive, uh, sorry, slightly more permissive with respect to overlap of the two transactions, but slightly less permissive with respect to overlap between the objects. Uh, so if the right phase complete of TI completes uh, before the, sorry, after the read phase of TK uh, completes, but before TK starts its write phase, then the only test we need to perform is to see whether there's a, a, a read uh, conflict. If TK, we need to only test to see whether TK reads an object that TI could have potentially written. Exactly, in this particular test. And then we have our third test. We have our third test where uh, now the, the timing is even more permissive. So there, there can be an overlap between uh, the write phases. There can be uh, even a partial overlap between the read phases. But now we need to test even more. Uh, so now we have to make sure that there is no intersection between uh, things that TK has read uh, things that TI has, has written. And in addition to that, we also have to test to see whether TK writes something that TI could have potentially written, because there could have been an out of order uh, set of operations there as well. OK, so um, basically, that allows us to, uh, this is basically a set of three tests. And I've already kind of answered this question. Um, so which of, these, which of these tests is the right test to use? So one of them is extremely permissive with respect to objects, um, but not particularly permissive with respect to overlap. Sorry. Uh, one, is, one is extremely permissive with respect to uh, how much uh, overlap there is between objects, but not permissive uh, as to overlap between uh, interleaved operations. Uh, so two are completely separate. It's great. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, one that's extremely permissive with respect to overlap, but is not permissive at all with respect to uh, oh, sorry, overlap of operations, but which is not permissive at all uh, with respect to overlap of uh, between objects accessed. So uh, which, which is the best? Three? Well, three is uh, extremely permissive. Uh, Three is potentially good. Two is also potentially good. One also kind of helps sometimes. Two? Well, two, uh, there, 
So it's sort of a, a trick question. Um, the the answer essentially is that you don't you each of them is a valid test, and the tests are actually progressively more and more uh, expensive. Uh, so the, the first test is absolutely trivial to perform. The last test is expensive um, and also doesn't permit certain things. Uh, so in short, you want to actually use all of them. Um, any of them is a, a valid, uh, if it passes any of those tests, if a pair of transactions passes any of those tests, it's a legitimate uh, scheduling of the operations in those two transactions. Okay. Um, uh, sorry? Uh, it basically, I uh, was trying to get at um, the, la the last test is something that is extremely expensive. Uh, set intersection is... Well, set intersection is a join, and uh, if, if you leave this class with nothing, uh, nothing else, uh, learn this. Joins are expensive. Avoid joins as much as possible. Um, also, by the way, why no SQL is, is so... Uh, why people claim it's so fast. It's so fast because they don't support joins, um, typically. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, set intersection is expensive. You generally don't want to do the ladder tests if at all possible, and the ladder tests are also very restrictive with respect to uh, conflicts between objects. So, in, in general, you, you want to uh, you want to do each of the tests, and there, there's also considerable overlap between the the computation required for each of the tests. Okay. Um, Right, so, uh, so that's the uh, that's a set of of interactions between different transactions. Um, in order to do the the validation, we essentially want to perform all three tests. Uh, but you know, something to uh, something to keep in mind here is that this this validation step and and uh, more precisely the writes. Uh, they, these are essentially uh, operations that can't happen concurrently. So the, the right, you don't want two write phases happening at the same time because uh, in that case, two, two operations could potentially overwrite each other's... Uh, you, uh, the one transaction could potentially actually overwrite uh, a value that a second transaction uh, was trying to write. Uh, now, because this copying process tends, uh, tends to be fairly expensive, uh, this is not ideal. And so one of the things we're going to talk about in uh, a couple of slides is uh, ways of more efficiently uh, dealing with, with this sort of write phase. Um, but there's, a, there's sort of one trivial optimization that you can perform already, which is that if, uh, if you're doing a purely re a read-only transaction, uh, then... There is no write phase, uh, and as a consequence, you don't really need a critical section there. You just need to make sure that you're reading a consistent state. Uh, question? Yes? Uh, generally, well, so more precisely, you don't. You want to make sure that the write phase, the writes in the write phase, get applied in a consistent order. Uh, so if two operations uh, both write to the same object. You want the one with the higher timestamp to actually perform the write. Uh, what do you? Sorry. Uh, then the transaction aborts and presumably gets restarted, and uh, the write phase doesn't occur either. And because the write phase hasn't occurred, uh, you don't need to roll anything back. The read phase is where it executes the whole transaction. The write phase, so the re, during the read phase, all writes get uh, buffered. They get stored, um, but not applied to the overall database state. 
is based on the U T one T two necessarily U Mexico. Well, the, so the rate phase. Typically, the assumption is that the the cost of uh, the bulk of the costs of uh, computation are going to be to uh, actually compute the things that you you need to update to compute the the objects the va and the values that you're going to write. Once you have the writes themselves, so I, I, I say that the write phase is expensive, but it's still uh, the the assumption is typically that the write phase is going to be much cheaper than the read excuse me, the, the read phase, where you actually compute what it is that you need to update. The write phase in that, after that point is just basically a big bulk copy. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Mm-hmm. So uh, the the three different tests actually uh, have non intersecting non intersecting. Uh, so the question is uh, uh, is test three more robust than test one? Um, test the the three different tests actually have non overlapping uh, result sets. Something that satisfies test three might not satisfy test one. Uh, but something that satisfies test one might not necessarily satisfy test three. Uh, so you want to perform all three tests, and if it passes any of those tests, then it's a legitimate, uh, then, then you can accept that particular transaction. Okay. Um, right. So uh, obviously, uh, optimistic, concur uh, optimistic concurrency control uh, is uh, a little more flexible, uh, but it also brings with it uh, a couple of overheads. And uh, the, the, the biggest one here is essentially tracking the read and write sets. Um, maintaining these, uh, creating a, a set object is uh, at, the scale, at, at the speeds that we're considering here, uh, creating a read and a write set is actually fairly expensive. Um, the, the copy, you're, the other thing is that you're essentially creating a, a duplicate of large portions of the database. Basically any update uh, actually has to get written twice. So you're paying twice the overhead uh, for every single write. Um, and especially if you don't have enough memory for the entire transaction or to buffer all of those writes, uh, this can get very expensive very quickly. Uh, and finally, the, uh, probably the worst cost is that if there is a failure, if something does, uh, there is something problematic, uh, then you might need to uh, restart a transaction, which in turn, uh, well, any computations you've already performed uh, potentially go to waste. Um, any questions on this? So there's a slight variant of this um, called optimis optimistic two-phase locking. Uh, which actually works a little bit like concurrency control in that you're going to, uh, well, you do the locking as normal, uh, but rather than writing an object, you essentially buffer all of your writes. And then at the very end of the transaction, you uh, try and obtain exclusive locks on the objects that you're writing. Uh, now, this is somewhat like uh, optimistic concurrency control, uh, but the... Uh, Rather than killing a transaction that produces a conflict, uh, the, conflicting, the conflicting transaction uh, is just blocked until uh, the, the relevant locks are released. Uh, you can still come into a deadlock situation. Uh, you still might need to kill the transaction, uh, but this is actually uh, slightly more uh, liberal on that front. Um, any qu questions on optimistic two-phase locking? Okay, uh, so... Uh, that's optimistic concurrency control. Uh, there, there's one other uh, concurrency control technique uh, that we're going to talk about, and that's this idea of uh, timestamp concurrency control. So we've, we've already uh, 
mentioned this idea of, um, of using timestamps for transactions in order to define the order that we're, we're going to execute them in. Uh, for timestamp concurrency control, uh, the idea is essentially to give every transaction a timestamp before it executes, uh, rather than after, uh, after the read phase is finished. So in this case, there is just the one phase, uh, and at the very beginning of the, yes? Potentially, yes. Yes. So test one is incredibly cheap, and you can there. So for test one, uh, you're checking basically to see if the two transactions don't overlap in time. Uh, if they and so presumably you're not going to have that many transactions going on at the same exact moment. So that's that's one thing. Um, Yes, uh, I mean it's it will be somewhat costly to test e even if you have a couple of thousand transactions going on at the same time. Uh, then basically, your uh, the the cost for testing all of them is going to be quadratic. Um, but there are a number of optimizations that you can still perform on top of that. Um, you can certainly index things by uh, values in the read and write set. Uh, the optimistic two phase uh, locking process is, is sort of a form of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially you need to make sure that the transaction doesn't conflict with anything else that has happened at the same time. So uh, you, you the, the cost comes around somewhere. And what I guess the main the main takeaway from this section is that you can shift that cost around to various places, and uh, we've talked about a number of different uh, places that where you can put that cost. But there is still a cost to ensure that uh, a transaction gets executed in a consistent manner. Does that answer your question? In effect, yeah. Um, the in effect, yes. Although, I will. Um, I may need to get back to you on that. Uh, but you're you're right. There there is a. a there is a somewhat subtle distinction, and I'd need to phrase that properly. Um, ah, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so that's that's the distinction. Um, the if it passes, so the the only case where you have that overlap between write phases is in, if it passes test three, and if it passes test three, then there's no conflict between the two. Uh, there's no conflict between objects written in that case. Uh, the validation phase still has to be atomic, but the write phases can be overlapped. That is actually a typo in the slide. Um, that is actually a mistake in the slide. Uh, the the right phase, basically if it passes all three of those tests if it passes those tests uh, yeah basically if it passes all of uh, all of those tests then there will not be any conflict in the right phase uh, but you still need to uh, you still need the validation phase to be atomic because the um, you still need the validation phase to be atomic. Uh, because the uh, read and write sets could potentially be changing. Okay, uh, right. So, mm, all right. Let's see how far we get in this. Uh, so the the last 
concurrency control method, uh, method that we're going to talk about is this idea of uh, timestamp concurrency control. And the idea here is that every object uh, basically gets assigned a, a read and write timestamp. We can use those timestamps in order to, to make sure that no conflict has occurred. Um, basically, we track every single operation that has happened on that particular object, and every time we do a read or a write, uh, we can make sure that uh, that read or a write will not introduce a conflict. So again, uh, we assign each uh, transaction a timestamp at the very start, and then when the transaction reads from a given object, uh, then all we need to do is make sure that uh, the timestamp of the, uh, the 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 last times the timestamp of the last transaction to write to that object is not greater than the the current transaction's timestamp. So we essentially enforce a serial ordering. Um, we enforce equivalence to a serial ordering that follows the, the order of the timestamps. Um, so basically, if a transaction tries to read from a, concept, a, a logically later transaction, uh, then you need to abort the transaction uh, and, and restart it potentially with a newer timestamp, or definitively with a newer timestamp. Um, if the last transaction to write the object uh, had a lower timestamp, on the other hand, then the read is perfectly safe. Um, however, we also need to indicate that a transaction has read that particular object. So we're going to uh, set the, the read timestamp of that object uh, to uh, either the, the current timestamp or uh, if it's if it was read already by a, a, a transaction with a higher timestamp, then you don't need to change anything. But you need to at least uh, set it to um, no. The the new read timestamp needs to be no lower than uh, the timestamp of the current transaction. Is that yes? No, no. So this uh, this is a completely separate. Uh, that was optimistic concurrency control. Uh, you execute the entire thing. Uh, the entire transaction up front, and then subsequently copy its its writes. Uh, in timestamp concurrency control, you have uh, everything uh, gets applied to the database directly. But now every single object has a timestamp that tracks to see what uh, what the timestamp of the last operation applied to that particular object was, or what the last transaction to read or write from that object is. Right. So. Um, Basically, for reading, we just need to make sure that the tr uh, current transaction has a higher timestamp than the last transaction to write that particular object. Um, and if it does, we just update the read timestamp to be at least the timestamp of the current transaction. Um, if a transaction is trying to write to some object, we need to make sure that uh, it was not read by a transaction that occurs logically later, uh, because if, if that was the case, then this transaction would potentially lead to a dirty read. Um, if that happens, we need to abort the transaction uh, and restart it from scratch. Um, if the right time, uh, if the right timestamp of that particular object uh, is is higher than the, the current transaction's timestamp, uh, then essentially there's a, a transaction that occurs logically later, logically after the current transaction, uh, that has already written an, a value to that object. Uh, now, this doesn't actually require an abort. Uh, it just means that uh, the current transaction's write uh, is essentially overwritten by a later transaction. So we just discard the, the write. Um, we don't need to restart anything. Uh, and otherwise, we, uh, we just allow the write and update the write timestamp as with the read timestamp. Is, uh, is this clear? What do you mean by even on the write? Sorry? Uh, even on the write. So the the high level idea here is that we're essentially trying to create a schedule that is guaranteed to be uh, equivalent to a uh, to a serial to the serial schedule that follows the order of the timestamps. So uh, so essentially, what what this means is that uh, a a, a uh, 
transaction that comes later in the serial schedule has already written a, a written to that object, which means that any if you follow that particular serial schedule, any subsequent uh, any writes to that object by transaction TI would be overwritten by the later transaction. So if the transaction has already performed that write, then basically this just means that uh, the, the write sh would have been overwritten and you can just uh, discard that write. Is that clear? Uh, running a little short on time, so skip a little bit. Um, okay, uh, so the uh, actually let me go back. Um, so now this this is a fairly expensive process. If a transaction comes along that performs a, a, a write to a value that's already been read. Uh, Ideally, you'd, you wouldn't necessarily want to restart that transaction. You'd want to do something. Um, so the, the question now is, is can, we, can we do better than that? And uh, the short answer is uh, yes. So rather than storing uh, one concrete copy of the database, we're going to actually store uh, potentially multiple different versions of every single object in the database. We still have a single uh, structure representing the entire database, but now that elements of that structure can point to what's uh, known as a version pool that is going to store older versions of every single object uh, in the database. Now, uh, the idea here is that a reader is always going to be allowed to uh, read some version. So if a, if a read comes in for an object that has already been overwritten by another transaction with a higher timestamp, uh, the, the reader can still go sort of back in time to find out what the, uh, what the value of that object is uh, or was at some point uh, <coughs> earlier, at uh, some point before that particular transaction. Um, so, yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, we do something very similar to uh, timestamp concurrency control. Uh, but now, in addition to keeping uh, one version of every object, uh, we keep sort of a history of every object. And every uh, object in the, in the history has an associated uh, right timestamp, the, the timestamp of the transaction that wrote that particular version of the object, uh, not the entire object. Now, when a transaction comes along uh, and wants to perform a read, it basically goes through this list of, of versions and finds the one that has the highest write timestamp uh, that occurs before the, the transaction's own timestamp. Uh, and it can do this pretty efficiently because typically these get stored in some sort of uh, linked list. Um, so if a transaction performs a read on a given object, uh, essentially what it'll, what it'll do is it'll just start from the latest version of the object and go back until it finds the version uh, that is, uh, sorry, until it finds the version uh, that is immediately preceding its own timestamp. Um, and assuming that you have some version of every single object for every point in time, uh, even if that means that the object hasn't been created yet, uh, then this essentially means that the reader transactions never need to be restarted because they can never, uh, they can never read, uh, you, you never have a write follows read conflict. Uh, they may need to, by the way, uh, block until a writer uh, commits. So if this object, if it's trying to read this object, uh, but uh, the transaction that created this object hasn't committed yet, uh, then the, read, the reader may need to block until that uh, is actually properly committed, but otherwise this is not a problem. Um, right. Now if the transaction is trying to do a write, then it needs to do a little bit more testing. 
So normally what it would do is just insert a new, uh, a new object into this linked list, a new version of the object into this linked list. Uh, if it's uh, the, latest, the latest transaction to write that particular object, it would just insert it into the head of, head of the list. Otherwise, it would go back in time and, and insert it earlier. Um, uh, but now it also needs to make, sh uh, each, each version of the object also needs to have an associated read timestamp. And there is a, sort of a small window. Uh, well, let, me, let me draw this. So you have two versions of the object. This happens, let's say, at timestamp five. This happens at timestamp, uh, the latter one, uh, the latter right uh, is written at timestamp eight. Now a read transaction comes along uh, at timestamp, let's say, uh, six. Uh, it comes along, let me, seven. A uh, retransaction comes along at timestamp seven, goes back in time, uh, reads from the version at timestamp five, performs that read. Uh, so now this thing has a read timestamp of seven. Now, if another transaction comes along at timestamp uh, six, and wants to do a, sorry, a timestamp, yeah, timestamp six, and wants to do a write for that particular object, it actually needs to go back in time. Uh, it needs to, it can't insert a value at this point in the list because there's already uh, another transaction that uh, tried to read that, that has already read that object. There's another transaction, in this case, a timestamp seven, uh, that assumes that this object uh, has that uh, essentially is, uh, has, has already assumed that the value of this object at timestamp seven uh, was the value of that object. And if this write comes along, it would essentially change the value of that object at timestamp seven, uh, which we can't allow. So uh, I'll make that a little more clear on Friday. Uh, looks like